Vice-Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria, Professor Tawane Kupe, Professor Vusi Tebe, Head of the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology, distinguished guests, members of staff and students. I'm Professor Vasu Reddy, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities. Please join me in welcoming the Vice-Chancellor and Principal, Professor Kupe, who will introduce Professor Tebe. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and I should also say good morning, good afternoon in those jurisdictions because we are doing this virtual and online. Who might have joined us today because inaugurating professors are global scholars. A warm welcome on this chilly night down here in South Africa, but a very good day. Today, we meet here to hear Professor Vusilis Wetebe profess what he professes. What does the professor profess? We will hear that very shortly. Allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to make some brief biographic details about Professor Vusilis Wetebe. Vosilis Wetebe is a professor of development studies and head of the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology. Professor Tebe joined the University of Pretoria as a senior lecturer in development studies in the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology from Monash, South Africa in 2015. He has also worked as a lecturer at the National University of Lesotho. Professor Tebe received his BSc Sociology Honours from the University of Zimbabwe and his MA in Rural Development and PhD in Development Studies from the University of East Anglia in the United Kingdom. His research focuses on understanding former migrant labor societies, emphasizing Southern Africa's former labor reserves. He's particularly interested in dissecting worker peasant dynamics, the land and agrarian question, gender dynamics and livelihood change, dynamics of change, food security, climate change, adaptation, and policy responses. His current research project focuses on social change and the changing food security situation in former migrant labor societies in Southern Africa, which has produced 10 research outputs between 2017 and 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the inaugurating professor, Professor Vusilizwe Tebe. Good evening, Mr. Vice-Chancellor and Principal, Professor Cooper, Mr. Dean, Professor Reddy, colleagues, friends, and family. My lecture for the day is entitled, Former Migrant Labor Societies and Questions of Transformation in Contemporary Southern Africa. I feel honored to stand here today and talk on former migrant labor societies found in some parts of Southern Africa, particularly in former sector countries and peripheral territories to reflect on their future and future policy. The subject is not new and for years it has been the preoccupation of academics and government in the region. It is also a subject that reminds many of us of an unfortunate history of the region. I have spent my, my career as an academic working in and with these rural societies in different countries and today's lecture is a critical reflection on this long association. Admittedly, these rural spaces have undergone massive changes in response to changes in the environment. However, continuities in thinking and policy indicates a state of either blatant denial or how deeply embedded assumptions that underlie the ideal type of rural society have become. By way of background, I want to begin by sharing the motivation behind my lecture today. Today's lecture stems in part from a desire to share my views on these rural spaces, but also to counter negative narratives about these rural spaces. In Southern Africa, migrant labor societies are defined by their historical formation and the political objective behind their creation. They have been characterized by a negative conceptualization of social formations and social dynamics within them. The general narrative has often come to define understandings of these rural spaces in terms of surplus production, divided families, and the destructive consequences of oscillating migration to family life, 
on the one hand, and land tenure, agriculture, productivity, and commitment on the other. From the coronal period to post-independence, the, de the development vision was set alongside the perception that a worker peasantry found in these rural spaces was an obstacle to development. Given the perceptions about the structural and institutional impediments held by both policymakers and scholars, these areas were transformed through familiar policy models used elsewhere in the developing world. While recognizing the significance of development, I soon realized that the model rural society that policy sought to create bore little resemblance to the one I remembered and yet for long thought I knew. I will admit here, I have always been intrigued by the dynamics of life in former labor reserves. As a young boy, we would drive with my father to see his rural folks in the former Shangani reserves once a year, my first real experience of these rural spaces. It was during these visits that I came to realize that most of my father's male folks who would often join us on our trips to the reserve, lived in the city while their families were in the reserves. They appeared to be prosperous with investment in their rural homes and their households were well supported from the wages and formed the wealthiest class in the community. While these arrangements appeared somewhat strange to me, a city boy, they were a normal way of life and everyone seemed comfortable with them. Saturdays were always special days as women looked forward to welcoming their men or receiving remittances from the city. On Sundays, they would send letters mostly with lists of items required at home and other rural produce to those in the city. Of course, I envied this life and often looked forward to these visits for we were received special treatment as visitors from Egoli, Johannesburg. However, my really encounter with these rural spaces came much later when I was in high school and my father sent me to complete my high school education at one of the schools in Zimbabwe. I would benefit from a better education system, I was told. My schoolmates mostly came from former reserves and I came to learn a lot from them and their experiences. But more importantly, I was able to visit and interact with my father's rural folks more regularly and I began to see these spaces more clearly and to understand the internal dynamics even better. Finally, I spent one and a half years in the former Shangani Reserves for my master's and PhD fieldwork, where my interaction with household reinforced my initial understanding and contentions. I completely disagreed with the interpretation of many aspects of these rural places. My views and understanding of former migrant labor societies formed during my early encounters form the bulk of my presentation today. Answering the questions above requires an understanding of migrant labor societies and their history and an attempt to distinguish these from other types of and forms of rural societies. Historically, migrant labor societies were established in the region in response to the demand for labor by emerging capital. In countries like South Africa and Zimbabwe, where secular colonialism was prominent, these were established as places of confinement for indigenous population in the form of native reserves and or bantustans. With the recruitment of extraterritorial workers, these were extended to communities in northern Rhodesia, now Zambia, Nyasaland, now Malawi, and the Portuguese East Africa, which is now Mozambique, which became labor reserves for Southern Rhodesian employees in the 1920s, and South Africa mining cap capital in the, in the late 19th century. The shift towards extraterritorial workers meant that South Africa's labor reserves expanded to neighboring countries like Botswana, Lesotho, Mozambique, Malawi, Namibia, and even Zimbabwe, which became labor suppliers. In its simplest definition, a migrant labor society is one where labor migration forms part of the livelihood of individuals and the household. In other ways, it is a migrant sending society where large numbers of men participate in the weight economy through the sale of their labor time and often spend extended period away from home. Michael Burawoy, 
refers to a dual dependence on employment in the labor market and under the legal and political systems where they are employed. This implies that migrant laborers remain what Arigi terms appendages of the peasants with strong links to the real society to which they belong and meant to return even after several years away. This implies that migrant labor exists alongside the practice of agriculture and in secular states in the region, peasant agriculture continued as part of a dual agrarian structure and supplemented the wage. In countries like Lesotho, agriculture became a low status occupation subordinated to and highly dependent on migrant labor. A key feature of these societies was the dominance of agriculture and the rural space by women, children, and the elderly. In Southern Africa, understandings and descriptions of migrant labor societies have drawn on conceptualization of radical scholars and later socialist administrators on the colonization, conquest, emergence of capitalism, exploitation, and demand for cheap labor. As territorial entities, migrant labor societies represented a colonial exploitative project where labor for emerging capital was drawn. Therefore, they were seen as fulfilling a political objective, and as such, their development only worked for the colonial state and capital. And often used the reference is that of a cheap labor reservoir. Bush and Cliff described these areas in terms of the reproduction of labor power and used the elsewhere in the economy in capitalist production in terms that make it available cheaply as some form of migrant labor. In other words, extra economic forms of cohesion became a significant tool in turning traditional rural society into cheap labor reservoirs. However, we cannot ignore the element of choice, and I concur with Burroway that African workers became attracted to wage employment as a way of making up or supplementing their means of subsistence. As Ariki argues, over time, people get used to what they consume and, and discretional consumption items become necessities whose consumption becomes indispensable. As demand for income multiplied in response to discretional consumption, participation in the money economy became necessary, forcing households to send more men into the labor market. The literature explains this process and its implication for the rural economy. Boyam shows how Basutu household responded to employment opportunities in the South African mines as labor migration brought substantial income to the rural economy. I move to the next section where I look at migrant labor societies and the worker peasant problem. What is the relationship between migrant labor societies and worker peasantry? What are the adverse consequences of worker peasantry? These questions are of interest to me and define the scope of this lecture. How we understand migrant labor societies, particularly as they, are, they exist in the region, depends a great deal on how we view the resultant structural formations and consequences of these structural factors. A central issue in the debates on migrant labor societies is the phenomena of the worker peasant or split families. This phenomena has been subjected to relentless critique from various sources, exposing its negative consequences. Associated with the worker peasantry is the challenge of divided families brought about by the culture of oscillatory migration. The essential characteristics of the worker peasantry is and has been the out-migration of men who sustain relationship with the rural societies through visits and financial and material support and by leaving families behind. Another characteristic is that these migrants retain their rights to land. The interlinked feature features of land tenure arrangements, part-time farming, and commitment to agriculture, poor land husbandry, and access to alternat alternative sources of livelihoods and income often impeded the productivity of the land and agricultural development. And as a consequence, 
these rural spaces this contribution to the national economy. The subsistence orientation and inefficiency of the worker peasant were often seen as an impediment to the development of scientific agriculture in rural areas, and thus the need for the, for the worker peasant to be eliminated. Another issue in the debates on the worker peasantry and migrant labor refers to the potential social effects viewed in welfare terms. One key issue is the impoverishment of rural society, which is robbed of the presence of men who often oscillate between the countryside and the places of capitalist accumulation. The absence of men tended to generate economic insecurity, marital disharmony, emotional misery, and problems re related to sexual morality. This, according to critics, created conditions for social problems, including destruction of families, as husbands would end up establishing second homes at their places of work. It is apparent that similar kinds of issues like husband failing to send remittances back home and at worst sexual health issues, including the high risk of HIV AIDS, were also integral to the system. A related issue was the absence of decision-making power by the women left behind, despite their custodian of the rural home. In, in patriarchal society, where authority lies with men, the women left behind might have had limited rights to medium to long-term decisions affecting their households. Ultimately, this de demonstrates an inability on the part of the social system to operate efficiently. It also illustrates the structural weaknesses of the system. In this case, the lobby for policy reforms that would create a different social order should be understandable. However, this representation of migrant labor societies disguised the complex social realities and implicit contradictions between theoretical models and the social realities on the ground. This portrayal also provided and still provide, manages to do so, a justification for social engineering as governments sought to introduce radical transformation in these rural societies. I move next to the next section where I want to talk about how the state sought to transform these areas. In an essay written by Ray Bush and Lionel Cliff, in the early 1990s, they identified transformation as a fundamental problem that Southern African countries face in the post-colonial era. They asked a critical question, whether these societies that served as labor reserves could be easily transformed to eliminate labor migration. In Southern Africa, transformation in these societies is not new. We need to recall the agricultural modernization push in the 1940s and 1950s when state-led betterment policies were implemented in British secular states in the region and Kenya in East, in East Africa. However, even before these state-led programs, efforts to create a modernized reserve agriculture were already underway in the then southern region through the intervention of Emily Arford. However, state-led transformation programs did not occur until the 1950s with the enactment of the Native Land Husbandry Act of 1951. The law embodied some of the assumptions about agricultural development held by many modernizers in Africa and provided the blueprint to transform reserve agriculture by creating modern and progressive farmers. Similar reforms in secular South Africa can be pointed to as offering support to the transformative vision of African settlement. The Tomlinson Commission of 1955 was particularly noteworthy for its recommendations to create an agrarian middle class of young men full-time and economic productive farmers in Bantu areas. This also reminds us of betterment programs to improve, to improve agricultural production and conserve the environment in African reserves, which started in the 1930s. Fast forward to post-independence. 
transformative social engineering still dominates the policy agenda. Policy continuities cannot be ignored, particularly in Zimbabwe in the early 1980s. In Zimbabwe, the vision to transform former reserves into peasant economies was manifest through the implementation of programs like translocation, recyclement, and internal recyclement. As some authors have argued, post-independent recyclements were designed as self-contained islands of modernization where land benefit fisheries were expected to be full-time farmers. In some sense, the same policy trends could be identified in Lesotho, where Ferguson and Lawman show how donors scrambled to create an agrarian economy. While agricultural policies varied by country and period, they demonstrated striking similarities in, the, in their emphasis to create efficient farming communities. However, the critical distinction was not the type of agricultural program that were implemented, but they were mainly incomp that they were not mainly incompatible with the way of life in these societies. If they had been implemented with some success, these policies would have changed the entire social reality and allowed a new social reality to prevail. This might ostensibly be interpreted as social engineering. Two issues need to be understood in this regard. First, the implementation of the programs did not occur in a theoretical vacuum. They were influenced mainly by the development discourse of the time. Second, rural households, the target of policy interventions, did not perceive agriculture along the normative political contracts of good, modern, progressive farmers, and thus failed to identify with the programs that were implemented. The logical result was that they resisted, became at the at apathetic or adapted them to suit their needs and situations, as was the case with the Native Land Husbandry Act of 1951 and the resettlement schemes during the first phase of land reform in Zimbabwe. This takes me to the next section where I look at the realities in these migrant labor societies. From the available literature, it has become clear that critical ideas guiding transformation of former labor reserves emerged in the region in relation to a range of debates and practices that are firmly embedded in historical experience. This leads me to a question that I have grappled with throughout my academic career. Are these policies any more realistic today? Although rural areas is used uniformly to define areas that form the countryside. Rural areas are different, and it is often fair to think of migrant labor societies as distinct. Former migrant labor societies do not only reflect images of different and complexity, but defy conventional popular stereotypes about the rural society and specific rural dynamics that have guided policy interventions. Before I discuss, although brief, briefly, some aspects of the realities in these societies. The first one is land rights and communal tenure. We'll note that realities of how tenure systems operated in practice in former reserves depart from the ideal type. In all fairness, I might point out that this position is not entirely new. Not all scholars agree that communal tenure is a serious threat to development. We are well aware of the debates on tenure reforms and the various positions in these debates. If there is anything we can draw from these debates, it is that mistaken assumptions on the communal tenure model have guided tenure reforms. Several publications illustrate how tenure relations in practice do not fit the ideal model. Tenure regimes in African reserves are described by cousins as dynamic and evolving regimes. Like the social system, tenure also transformed in response to environmental changes and 
emerging opportunities and constraints. Of Lahati points out that in Zimbabwe, communal tenure has been shaped by local interest to enable the coexistence of subsistence farming and migrant labor. To understand how tenure systems ideally suited the situation of the worker peasant, we only have to think of the system of booking the land described by Nyambara 2001, where migrant workers secured land rights by, having, by leaving wives behind. Elsewhere, other authors show how household enjoyed de facto security of tenure and ownership. Therefore, Communal tenure could be considered the most appropriate model since it provides the flexibility required by a worker peasantry in a context of agricultural marginality. The second issue, I want to look at gender and the women question. A key area of criticism of migrant labor societies is the feminization of the rural space and as a consequence, the physical and emotional burden this imposed on women, who in the context of a patriarchal culture has relatively little power to make decisions. This was not always the case, as has been shown elsewhere. These studies showed that despite women only having de facto authority based on their temporal headship of household, they assumed prominent roles at both the household and community levels. Growing empirical evidence also indicates that labor migrant households are more likely to hire labor to reduce the work burden and responsibilities on their women. The third is wealthy and poverty. Associated with the phenomena of the worker peasantry was the question of social differentiation. Material possession placed this household in a different rural social structure. The wage income and remittances with the controlled made them the wealthiest in their societies. And literature has shown that they successfully combined wage, labor, and agriculture. Another characteristic was the ability to hire labor. The interlinked features of their capacity to recover from natural shocks, especially restocking livestock lost to drought and the purchase of inputs. Their social networks and investment in education guaranteed future survival. The investment made in agriculture in turn influenced the livelihood pathways after retirement. This is illustrated by a recent study on the cotton economy in the mid Zambezi Valley in which I grappled with the complex relationship between proletarianization and the rural agriculture and the significance of the rural economy within the life course of labor migrants. The fourth, is the land and land reform. The literature indicates that land, labor migrants need land. This issue is captured by Port's statement that the system rested on the migrant retaining access to land, which should, however, be insufficient to generate enough income to meet all a family's needs. To borrow Dugan's statement, reserve agriculture subsidized a worker's youth old age and family. When a migrant required land, he needed to secure land rights. He exercised this right of booking the land by circling his family. At the same time, he circulated between the rural and the urban. However, when the land was booked, it was not kept for its agricultural value and seen as some source of livelihood or alternative income. Agricultural activities remain subordinated to the wage, mainly invested into the rural space. Since rural land offered investment opportunities and future security, labor migrants often had an incentive to hold onto land and acquire more land by the same token. In other words, Demand for land among worker peasants might not necessarily have implied demand for livelihood. Such observations about the worker peasantry and land open up a plethora of questions about land reform and those advocating for land redistribution to dependency of worker peasants. As we have noted above, 
worker peasants need land. So worker peasants also benefited from land reforms, particularly in Zimbabwe. The worker peasant therefore poses significant policy challenges in rural development due to its complexity and unique characteristics. This takes me to the next section where I look at the future of migrant labor societies and what is the most appropriate policy for these societies. This discussion takes us back to the question once posed by Ray Bush and Lionel Cliff back in the 1980s. Although their question concerned the transformation of the agricultural system and structure, I want to pose the question slightly differently. What is the future of former migrant labor societies in Southern Africa? I want to follow this question with other related questions. Are these rural societies still relevant in the 21st century? What should be the future policy for these areas? As we have seen, since they emerged as labor reserves, these societies and dynamics within them were deemed very harmful. And the solution was often seen as simple, subject them to radical transformation. The changes that emerged in response to changes, changing demands were often ignored. Yet these changes meant that social reality was no longer the same as the contracts of these societies by policymakers. The challenge for this so society, therefore, is to accommodate the new reality in policy. Future policy for these societies, accordingly, needs to depart from the past to reflect and accommodate the new realities and to build these societies in a sustainable way. A worker peasantry continues to exist in former labor reserves in the region. In Lesotho, where agriculture is cage intensive, its practice and success have remained subordinated to the wage. In Zimbabwe, some post-independent studies have shown that labor migrants choose to hold on to land despite opportunities to remain in the urban permanently. Others also emphasize the role of the wage on agriculture and social status. Unless urban employment and wages successfully compensate for the loss of subsidy and security provided by the rural la land, rural households will generally be reluctant to proletarianize fully. Similarly, in the context of climate change and the lack of extensive investment in agricultural irrigation infrastructure, agriculture remains unreliable as a livelihood pathway. Total dependence on the land is highly unlikely, particularly in former secular states in the region where worker peace and culture has become deeply entrenched in rural life. Policies can be divided, developed not to transform systems that are already in place, but we eliminate inefficiencies and allow this system to function more efficient and effective to benefit households. However, before discussing these policy options, I want to briefly discuss why these rural spaces still have a future in the contemporary era. In the recent past, we have witnessed a strengthening of the worker peasantry through the emergence of what I call new forms of semi proletarianization particularly in former labor reserves. Economic structural adjustment, the restructuring of the mining industry in South Africa and the subsequent retrenchment in the 1990s resulted in increased diversification of livelihoods by rural households which were initially well supported through the wage. In countries affected by these events, the economy entered a transitional phase in the 1990s and 2000s, which as Bowen put it, co consists in part of deindustrialization and the proletarianization of women. The informal sector's growth and the emergence of new forms of economic migration are also linked to this transitional phase. Many studies have covered migration from Zimbabwe and Lesotho to South Africa. In Zimbabwe, what has become known as the Ukiakia economy 
provide survival opportunities in the context of social economic crisis. For rural households, all hands are on the deck with members involved in virtually anything, everything, and everywhere. Of critical importance in these emerging trends, particularly in Zimbabwe, is the emergence of the frontier farmer whose success has been based on access to wage income, exploitation of flexi the flexibility of the communal tenure, and availability of Makombo, which Chimo and whom define not only as virgin land, but also abundant land where one can tame material. It clears much land as one well as the energy to and the development of Mindamurefu, which are long fields for extensive farming. Yet these are different from your ordinary farmer who survive from the land because of the diversity of assets they own and support from members still employed in the wage sector. In addition, the rise in the phenomena of the jury women hated households has made this area very special. The prominence of this household has been attributed to the death of men, and while each household, such households have been characterized as poor, a large majority are still well supported from the non-farm economy. Last, but more importantly, is the youth problem. In particular, the youth in general and informal labor migrant societies are increasingly seen as presenting serious policy challenges. Today, effective policies are needed if the youth is to fulfill its role in the future. There is a greater realization that the youth in these societies have different characteristics and tend to have different needs. This realization is based on the fact that these are mostly educated youth whose ambitions lie outside agriculture. Indeed, literature has, has shown that youth have no interest in agriculture and do not view it as an occupation. Now, going back to the question, what makes these rural areas a significant part of 21st century rural society? I provide a caricature of issues that are roughly uniform in most of them. First, the unemployment problem and growing urban poverty. Almost all countries in the region experience economic challenges. Among the most salient of these since the 1990s are those connected to deindustrialization, the loss of employment opportunities locally, and the growth of the informal sector. At the same time, the crisis and its varied effect have affected the economy's ability to create new jobs. In most of these countries, urban poverty has become a reality, with most urban populations living in the informal settlements. Moreover, the cost of living in the urban areas has kept rising, while really incomes continue to shrink. This can be seen in Zimbabwe, where the economic, economic crisis has reduced formal employment opportunities resulting in the informal sector filling the gap. The economic policies of the past three decades can be said to have failed in creating economic stability, leaving the majority of the population either unemployed or underemployed. In Lesotho, the emergence of the textile industry appears to have compensated for the loss of mining jobs. It has reduced unemployment, employing mainly women. Yet literature shows that the number of Basutu cross-border migrants working in the farms or the domestic sector in South Africa has increased. Literature also indicates how wages paid in the textile industry are so low that these workers live in temporal lodgings while migrant workers only work for specified times in South Africa and then return home. The second relates to the failure of rural agriculture. Sub-minimum rains and the resultant agricultural crisis prevail prevalent in recent years has forced rural households to diversify livelihood strategies. Until 2020, persistent clouds were experienced in most regions in southern Africa. This made off-farm livelihoods even more critical. In countries like Lesotho, livelihood strategies have tended to lean towards temporal migration. 
in Zimbabwe, rural households have turned towards artisanal mining, which they perform alongside agriculture. Furthermore, non-farm livelihoods have proven to be rewarding and provide stable income in wages and associated returns. However, both the temporal nature of off-farm livelihood and the insecurity of such livelihood, coupled with family responsibilities, ensures that people retain the rural home. The third is the changing labor migration trends. An area receiving both policy and academic attention in the region is cross-border migration from neighboring countries to South Africa and the benefits of such migration. The past few years we have seen a change in migration trends in the region in Lesotho. In Lesotho, formal labor migration has been replaced by informal migration of mainly women to commercial farms and the domestic sector. In Zimbabwe, the usual rural to urban migration has been overtaken by the new trend, migration to South Africa. As literature has shown, these are primarily secular migrants who often return home after a certain period. This implies that these migrants still keep the rural home where they spend most of the time, leaving only when opportunities arise across the border. Those working in the farms would mostly go during peak seasons. Like the leper migrant of old, these migrants maintain only temporal homes in South Africa. Others are accommodated in compounds at work. But more importantly, are the returns of such migration as attested by the emergence of a lucrative cross-border transport business that cater for the movement of remittances to Zimbabwe and other formal channels of remittances. Finally, I look at other new challenges affecting agriculture and employment. In rural societies that depend on agriculture, there is an ever-increasing threat of climate change. Climate change and different climate-related factors could lead to problems in agricultural production from rural households. In the past few years, this could be seen when recurrent drought induced by climate change resulted in food security crisis in most regions, where most households had to depend on humanitarian aid. In addition, as the literature indicates, countries in the region are facing an urbanization crisis, which has put a strain on the delivery of services, particularly housing. A large proportion of the urban population is without proper housing and live in improvised settlements. The majority of people in informal settlements in countries in the region, South Africa included, are mainly migrants from rural areas and other African countries, and their livelihoods are insecure. Furthermore, we need to acknowledge land shortages in the region generally, and in former secular states in particular, and that the majority of the rural population live either on degraded and poor quality land, or they have insecure tenure. Indeed, in recent years, a consensus has emerged that land reform could be a solution to landlessness and poverty. And these have been implemented in most countries in the region. A host of these, both secular and crown countries have instituted land reform in their variant, be it land redistribution, tenure reforms, and restitution, hoping to achieve the promised land reform miracle. But these processes have only served to create a new agrarian elite. What should be the new approach to policy for former labor migrant societies found in South Africa? First, spreading risk is a central feature of migrant labor societies in, as households exploit opportunities in rural and urban sectors to achieve livelihood security and accumulation. In the context of increased vulnerability, particularly to natural shocks, diversification of livelihood in general is recognized as a strategy to reduce the exposure of households. Livelihood diversification taken here as an active 
social process whereby households are observed to engage in increasing intricate portfolios of activities over time is compatible with the history, culture, and practices in former labor reserves, which we have come to take for granted. Hence, rather than focusing on transformation and creating small big farmers, the policy focus should, should create opportunities for diversification for households to cope with crisis and satisfy accumulation motives. And this brings me to my conclusion. Former migrant labor societies in Southern Africa are complex and unique sp spaces. They are not just rural areas, they are not spaces of poverty, and neither are they places where women suffer because of the pattern imposed by the out-migration of men. While transformation has long been seen as the only solution to develop these human spaces, this amount to social engineering. These areas typically have adapted to the changing economic, political, physical, and social environment, and hence the new social order is appropriate to the circumstances of those who live and experience them. Even in the face of adversity, their survival tells a story. They are a permanent feature of the Southern African rural landscape. Although it reminds us of an unfortunate history, it cannot take away the fact that they have become a central part of people's life and existence. To many, this may sound ludicrous, but these rural, area, rural spaces should be left alone. State intervention may be warranted to facilitate efficiency and effectiveness, not because there is a need for an overhaul. Before I go, I want to turn my focus to you, on us as academics. Some of us come from these rural spaces, who grew up there and benefited from these arrangements. Some of us still relate to these spaces. Others still patronize them. My question then is, what is your position in the, on this subject? Do, you, do we allow modern, our modern education to destroy this heritage? Unfortunate as it is, but it is what matters. Should we rob our children of this heritage? Every time there is a drought and I see rural folks queuing for humanitarian assistance and for food parcels, my heart bleeds. And I ask myself, would, would this have been the same if farm household at the security of the urban? Colleagues, friends, it is already late in the evening and I feel I should bring this lecture to a close. However, it would be very ungrateful of me to do so without acknowledging specific individuals. I want to thank all present here for, for gracing this occasion. I realize that you had other commitments, but you made time to be with us today. In particular, the two women who shaped my academic career. Dr. Christine Okali and Prof. Nitya Rao of the University of East Anglia. My students and colleagues from the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology. My mother, Mangwenya. May God keep you longer. To my family, particularly my partner, Nonsanta, thank you for your support and encouragement. To young Nomtevo and Tom Figile, in Tom Biasema Pokwen, I know you are watching. To Sean Gwandogushe, I know you wanted to be here today, but it did not happen because of the COVID situation. I'll make it up to you. And finally, to the departed, my father, John Manitebe, you will always be remembered. You introduced me to these rural spaces I'm talking about tonight. Thank you. Colleagues and distinguished guests, please join me in congratulating Professor Tebe. 
thank you for presenting us with an interesting insight into migrant labor societies and obliging us to rethink our underdeveloped assumptions about the nature of these societies. Professor Terbe, your lecture reminds us that our reassessment needs to appreciate the multiple crises we face, such as growing poverty and inequalities, large-scale unemployment, and indeed climate change. In addition, policies that imported outdated notions of how to promote development are not only damaging to these migrant labor societies, but are doomed to failure. Prof Tebe has presented us with a truly decolonized reading of these societies and of the colonial inspired social engineering project aimed at transforming them. He has demonstrated yet again the growing importance of an African oriented development study stream in the faculty, providing us with an exciting and challenging research agenda that requires us to critically examine our own approaches and assumptions based on the realities of our time and place. Distinguished guests, Professor Tebe's inaugural lecture also reassures us that these issues will not remain marginal, but will instead form part of our continued academic project. Colleagues, my job will not be complete without also saying thank you to those who faultlessly worked behind the scenes to make this inaugural a reality. Vice Chancellor and Principal Professor Cooper, to you for your role this evening. Members of the University Executive for your support. Faculty Executive, staff and students, particularly those from the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology faculty staff from the Dean's office, in particular Heather Tainsma, staff from the Future Africa campus and Louis Cluter Productions, visitors, including friends and family of Prof Tebe, who are watching. Thank you for your presence tonight. I invite you to once more join me in congratulating Professor Tebe on his inaugural lecture. Please feel free to leave a message in the chat feature on your screen. And of course, to our live stream audience, I wish you a warm winter's evening and good night. Gaudiamus igitur.